uh, glad to see there's uh, some very good networking going on. Uh, it makes it a little bit harder for me to drag folks in, but it's worth it. So thank you for coming back in. So we'll move on to uh, session two. Uh, this is uh, nano and microphotonics and new applications. Our uh, co-organizers are Nelson Tenshu from uh, Lehigh and Mikhail Lipson from Cornell. And uh, Nelson, I believe you're making the first introduction? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nelson Tenso and Lehigh, and uh, my co-organizer is uh, Mikhail Lipson from Cornell. Um, this session is on the nanophotonics and uh, microphotonics and new application. Uh, obviously, photonics have impacted uh, you know, uh, many different areas, you know, from uh, communication, biomedical, biosensing, uh, you know, energy application, and many other areas that I, I do not actually list over here. Uh, you know, one of the things that's actually unique about photonics is it draws like, uh, uh, you know, expertise from many different areas, including obviously like in you know, physics, chemistry, which are more fundamental sciences, as well as like, you know, uh, more applied areas like engineering, uh, you know, multiple disciplines in engineering like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, you know, material science engineering, chemical engineering, and, and other engineering as well. Uh, so we put together this session uh, in Mikhail and I, uh, and basically we we look into like you know some of the topics that are more fundamental up to the so-called applied topics. And obviously you're going to see a mix of them. Uh, obviously from the four excellent speakers, we're very fortunate actually to get like you know uh, four really really good speakers. Uh, you know uh, that actually kind of span across this area. Uh, today's you know we're going to have like you know uh, topics on the so-called uh, you know optical antennas uh, based on sort of plasmonic technology as well as like, uh, uh, optical force based on the NEMS uh, technology. Now tomorrow we're going to look into the so-called uh, inter-subband quantum wall devices, uh, which is a novel type of the so-called semiconductor lasers and optoelectronics, as well as like you know uh, how semiconductor technology has impact on the so-called energy application. Uh, so um, I guess you know uh, I'm going to pass to Mikhail, uh, and then up before we put, uh, introduce uh, the speakers, uh, you know Mikhail has something to say, obviously on uh, some other application, like in particular on the silicon photonics as well. Mikhail. So. The reason why we call this session nano optics is because when you think usually about optics, you think about large scale, you think about tabletop, large fibers. Here, most of the devices that you're gonna, you're gonna see are smaller scale, meaning from the nanometer to the micron. And that opens up completely new directions, for example. Uh, one of the new applications, relatively new, about five, six years, um, is the use of optics to revolutionize standard microelectronics. So in the future, optics will be part of your computer. And that, was, that is enabled by this nano optics uh, field. So we're going to see several examples of that, not necessarily only for optics as computing, but we are going to see all of those fields um, uh, talking about uh, devices uh, that are on a very, um, on, a, on a smaller scale. So Nelson is going to first introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, and I'm going to be responsible for um, the, second. the second speaker. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Lucas? Yeah. The first speaker is Lukas Novotny. Uh, he's a professor uh, in the Physics Department and Institute of Optics uh, at the University of Rochester. Um, obviously, Lukas uh, uh, received his PhD in ETH Zurich uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and then after that, he went to, uh, for a career in uh, a national laboratory for three years, and after he, before he joined academia in University of Rochester. So uh, the talk will be on the so-called uh, optical antenna. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Lukas. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for having me for the invitation. And I thought I'd start with a slight introducing the institution I'm working with or for. It's the Institute of Optics in Rochester. And the reason I'm introducing this is because uh, uh, optics in Rochester is a, is a little bit different than uh, at other places. So we are, we, are, we are a department on our own. So we do not belong to electrical engineering or physics. So there's 17 faculty associated with this institute, and we cover optics all across the spectrum. So all the way from, say, quantum optics, more the fundamental aspect of optics, down to optical communication and optical engineering. Okay. The territory that I cover is called nano-optics. And as Michal alluded to, this deals very much with the manipulation of light 
on a length scale that is sub-wavelength in size. So traditionally, we think or we use or we manipulate light by redirecting the wave fronts. Okay, we have lenses, we have mirrors, we have diffractive, refractive elements, but all this is based on the redirection of wave fronts. Now, if we go to the radio frequency or microwave regime, lots of the manipulation we actually not do with lenses and the redirection of the wave fronts because the wave fronts are huge, uh, the wavelengths is huge. No? So, so there we have tools, okay, developed like antennas that are absent in optical technology. And we try somehow to fuse um, these uh, concepts in, in, into the optical regime, okay? So uh, my talk is on the optical antenna. It's a very new concept. And I re re usually receive a lot of criticism, okay? Because, uh, you know, what is an antenna? And is it fair to call it an optical antenna? So I seek your input and criticism. So to, um, to bring my presentation into perspective, I start here with a device that generates light. So this is a fundamental like light emitting device. We have a host material here, blue, and in this host material we recombine charges, and as a result of this we generate light. Okay. Now the selling point here of the it's not good, huh? It's, it's, it's weak. So I'm going to use two. Right, so it's an intent. No, here. I don't, I'm not sure how to use that one. Here we go. Is that better, no? Okay. So we generate light, okay? And with the help of the antenna, we can generate more light. We can increase the efficiency, say, of this device. And this is very much an, an, you know, an analogy to your cell phone, no? If your cell phone didn't have the antenna and you only had here a receiving chip, yeah, it would not be very efficient. Okay? Or you know, uh, the other way around, if this was a you know, transducer, then uh, the antenna definitely helps you to release the energy. So um, basically what I just described is a light emitting device, a nanoscale light emitting device, antenna assisted. And by reciprocity, we can invert all the arrows, and then we get into the territory of photovoltaics. So here the antenna helps to absorb light in this little host medium and to generate the charge separation. And we can combine the two scenarios, and that gets us into the territory of spectroscopy. So we have light coming in. We induce in the material a polarization. Okay, and the induced polarization acts as a secondary source of radiation, generating outgoing radiation here. And so the antenna here serves two purposes, the in-coupling and the out-coupling of light. Okay. Now, the question is, can we call this an antenna? And so we did a little bit of research. What is an antenna? So etymologically, antenna derives from... <laughs> N, which means up. And then it has this root. This is an Indo-European root to stretch. Okay? And it is present in all the Indo-European languages. Okay? So from Greek to Latin, Hindi, Russian. Okay? Here are three examples in, in English language. Tension, pretend, tenacious. Okay. So taking this as a definition, we would say the antenna is the thing stretching up. Okay? <laughs> So that's a very forgiving definition because <laughs> most of us are doing antenna science. So. so in fact, here you see antennas in Italian language, no joke, in, in Italian language these are called antennas. No? Even the center post of a tent is called an antenna. No? So in biology we encounter antennas. They're not made of metals or long posts, but biologists are accustomed of calling this network here of, of these molecules a uh, biological antenna. This is an arrangement of 96 chlorophyll molecules in a protein. And this magic arrangement of these molecules allows the protein to very effectively absorb sunlight. Okay? So this is the primary process in photosynthesis. Now, you would say, well, you know, they're 96 molecules, so they act like 96 individual molecules. That's not the case. So they work cooperatively. 
okay? And by, you, uh, by this cooperative effect, they're much more effective than 96 individual chlorophyll molecules. Okay, so in engineering, we mostly refer to this device when we talk about antennas. And, you know, this is a, also a very relaxed definition, but we, we could say it's a device to catch electromagnetic waves. Now, in analogy to this, we define the optical antenna as a device to convert optical radiation to localized energy and vice versa. Of course, it doesn't tell us how good an antenna is. It just tells us that there is a free propagating part and there is a localized part, okay? And the antenna is here to transform between the two. Now, a normal lens, say, or a microscope objective in this definition would be an antenna. And it is, it's a poor antenna because the degree of localization is poor. We cannot focus or localize radiation better than half a wavelengths if we use diffractive elements. Okay. That's a diffraction limit. So this is the general problem statement that we encounter here uh, in this optical antenna business. We have the radiation field, and we have something that we call a receiver and transmitter. So in the optical regime, this can be a molecule, an ion, a quantum dot, something that sends out discrete photons. And the antenna here is basically the device that allows you to communicate between the molecule and the radiation field more effectively. Now, these three entities are not independent, and every radio engineer knows that, because the antenna influences the properties of my receiver or transmitter, and vice versa. This is a, this is a coupled entity. Okay. So every application has its own favorable antenna design. Now, this is a little bit history, because uh, this is a letter that we dug out in the Einstein archives in Jerusalem. And, and this is written by Edward Hutchinson Singe, and it is addressed to um, Albert Einstein in 1928. And what is interesting here is that this Mr. Singe, he wasn't a scientist, he wasn't an engineer, but his brother was. His brother was a professor of physics at Trinity College in Dublin, and I think this Singe here, in 1928, he had like a midlife crisis and called his brother and said, is there anything to do for me in science? And the Professor Singe said, you know, I'm about of writing a physics encyclopedia. And you could actually take on the job of being the middleman, communicating with the authors. And so this gave Singe the opportunity of sending or communicating here with Einstein. So, so the head of this letter is like, dear Professor Einstein, thank you for your contribution. It looks magnificent and will it be accepted as is. Einstein was very famous by then. But hey, listen to my great idea, okay? <laughs> so, so this is his great idea. This is the original sketch in his letter. And what you see here is this little particle, okay? It's a colloidal gold particle, and it serves here as an optical antenna. Singe proposes of irradiating this particle in total internal reflection by use of uh, what we call a cardioid uh, condenser, okay? And then bringing close by a biological section, and then looking at the transmitted light that is collected with an objective while the biological section is raster scanned. Now, in today's okay, um, um, environment, we, we think this is pretty straightforward. That, but there was no scanning at that time. Okay? This is the first ever mention of scanning. So even the electron microscopy community accredits Singe of inventing scanning. Okay? So not only did he get this concept right, but he also you know, said in order to translate this, okay, we need nanometer precision, and he speculated of using piezo-ceramic transducers. And so this was really far ahead of its time. Okay. So that's why you know, it got forgotten very soon again. So um, <laughs> Singe made a lot of very interesting contributions in, in a time of only three years. Okay. 
And then, you know, he probably overdid it. He was delivered to a nursing home. So from, from 1931 on, it was quiet around Singe. So his entire scientific career lasted three years. So take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> so Einstein replied, and he said, you know, this is in good old German, principiell unbrauchbar, basically useless. <laughs> and and uh, while well, Einstein has its reasons, he said, okay, well, once you have this total internal reflection here and you bring close by the biological section, what you will have is frustrated total internal reflection, okay? So your entire image field will go bright. And so you will not be able to discern this little interaction, okay, from the very bright background. And so Singe, okay, um, developed a little modification. He replaced the particle by a little aperture in an otherwise opaque screen. Okay. And he communicated this to the Einstein, and Einstein said, he, if you read this, Einstein was really annoyed by this correspondence by then. He said, you know, why don't you just publish? And so Singe did, and that's how we know about Singe, just because <laughs> he published, okay? Otherwise, I, I, I don't think anybody would be knowledgeable about all this history. Okay, so this is uh, the history of the early history of the antenna. The irony goes a little bit further because Singe's idea got patented in 2001 by Fuji and Xerox. This is from the patent. <laughs> Here you see the little particle of Singe, okay, incorporated in the end phase of what we call a solid immersion lens. This is a spinning disk. It is suggested to use this for magneto-optic data storage. Okay. So the antennas that we use in our laboratory are are today mostly synthesized from the bottom up. So we use colloidal particles as building blocks to build more complex antenna structures. The reason we are not using top-down fabrication is reproducibility. Okay? Um, occasionally you synthesize or fabricate an antenna that works, but you know, your next fabricated device might behave different. In, with colloidal chemistry, every antenna that we fabricate behaves in the same way. So we have single gold particles. This is like an 18 nanometer gold particle that is attached to a dielectric tip. Here we have like two gold particles. This is an 18 nanometer. Here you see a 40 nanometer on top. We have rods that act like lambda half antennas, okay? So they have a lambda half resonance along the long axis here. Good, so I, I will um, show a few examples uh, where we use these antennas, and the first one is Raman scattering. So our antenna here localizes incident radiation favorably on a target, a molecular target, and we're mixing the frequency of light with the frequencies of vibrations of the molecule. Okay, so it's like amplitude modulation here. So, this mixing process gives then rise to some and different frequencies, and this process is known as Raman scattering. Of course, there's not only one vibrational frequency, but there are many vibrational frequencies. So if we send this into a spectrometer, we might see something like this. We see individual vibrational peak, and all these peaks, you know, we, we can go to a lookup table or a database. This is a chemical fingerprint. We can uniquely identify what we're looking at in principle without prior information. Okay. So uh, we're applying this for, uh, to carbon nanotubes. They're very forgiving molecules because we can locate them. Uh, this is fabricated in, uh, at the Weizmann Institute in Israel by Ernesto Joselevich. So he is the master of producing very, 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 very long single wall nanotubes. And uh, to just show you how we use this antenna for imaging, you see this running pixel, this is the antenna scanning here over a fragment of nanotube. And whenever the antenna goes over the nanotube, we nicely see the spectrum showing us the vibrational uh, uh, fingerprint. So for every pixel here, we, we are storing an entire spectrum. Okay. So we, we acquire here a multi-dimensional image. And then by post-processing, for each vibrational line, we get a different okay, um, uh, grayscale image. So here's an example. This is, this is standard Raman scattering using like a confocal microscope. Okay. This is the one nanotube. 
if we zoom in, this is the best resolution that you can get, okay, with focusing optics. So we're using here a wavelength of about 650 nanometers, so the resolution is limited to about 250. Okay. So if we do the same thing with the antenna, then we can get to this resolution, so that gets us down to 50 nanometers. Now I would like to emphasize it's not all about resolution. It's also about the signal to noise. Because the antenna localizes the interaction to just a little area underneath the antenna. Okay, so that's why the signal in between here is very low. And then for each pixel in this image, we have an entire vibrational spectrum which allows us to identify what the tube structure is. Okay, so knowing these peaks, we know exactly the tube structure. We know whether it's semiconducting, metallic, and so on. Now, there are some lines here, okay, weak lines. They are usually momentum forbidden, so you should not see them. But if you have defects in the tube structure, they will show up. So we can use these, uh, this technique to identify defects in the tube structure. And this is an example. This is a topographic image. Just the wrong pointer here. It's a topographic image. So you, all you see here is lots of catalyst particles. The simultaneously acquired optical image using the, uh, the antenna is shown here. So this is just superimposed. So we are at this G line, we are not, we don't have any signature, okay, from the catalyst particles, only from the nanotube that winds itself through the zoo of catalyst particles. Now, other vibrational line is shown here. This is a, this is a, a this different vibrational mode, still another vibrational mode. From this vibrational mode, we know that we're looking at an 8.5 tube structure. The diameter is 0.9 nanometers. And then we have these two modes, and they show a very localized feature. And this localized feature is there where we initially had this giant catalyst particle. So this catalyst particle generates a very strong perturbative effect, which then, okay, allows to relax this momentum condition and makes these two vibrational lines appear there. Okay. So, uh, next topic, enhancing light emission. Here we're really looking at an optical cell phone, if you want. So, our transducer here is a single molecule, and for simplicity, uh, not really simplicity, just for reasons of theoretical validation, we're using an optical antenna that consists of just one gold particle. Okay. This could be more complex, but the spherical geometry you know, can be handled in an analytical formalism. So here you see the scenario on the energy level scheme. The molecule is characterized by discrete energy states, and external irradiation induces transitions between these states. Okay, we have an excitation to an excited state, then we have spontaneous emission here, and we have also stimulated emission. And the proximity of the antenna influences all these three rates. And the question is, okay, can we design the antenna in such a way that preferentially, okay, we can get more light out of the system? Okay, so we would like a lot of this stimulated rate. So the experiment is shown here. Here we have the single molecules. Here is the antenna. We excite the antenna and we detect uh, fluorescence uh, using the same optics. And if we run the experiment, this is what we typically see. So the black uh, dots are the data points. This is the separation between the antenna and the molecule. So as we bring the antenna close to the molecule, the fluorescence goes up. And this is the antenna effect, OK? The, an the gold particle there allows us to localize incident radiation onto the molecule. Therefore, we are able to excite okay, the molecule more effectively. But then we come here to this turning point. So at this point, the antenna suddenly has a perturbative effect on the molecule. What it really does is, it absorbs, okay, the light that is emitting by the molecule. So there's a sweet spot, okay? We want to use this hybrid here of molecule and antenna 
at the favorable separation. Otherwise, we are quenching the emission of the molecule. Now, once we know this favorable uh, separation, we can use this for imaging. Here you see a bunch of single molecules. They have different patterns because the transition dipoles are oriented differently on the surface. But if we zoom in, okay, this is the resolution you can achieve okay, with best optical microscopy. This is about 300 nanometers here for each individual molecule. And with the antenna, we can increase the resolution down to 65. And if you use a different antenna, even down to 10 or 15 nanometers. OK, so we are applying this also in biological research. This is Christiane Hüppener. She looks at calcium ion channel proteins in red blood cell membranes. And this is a 10 micron red blood cell. It's fluorescently labeled so that we can visualize these calcium ion proteins. If we zoom in, the resolution is not sufficient to make out these individual proteins. Okay? But if you now replace the lens with the antenna, then we can nicely visualize the location of each individual of these calcium ion proteins. OK, so um, <clears throat> I mentioned that if we come too close to the molecule, then we have a perturbative effect. The antenna absorbs the fluorescent emission from the molecule. Okay. So ultimately, this energy is dissipated in heat. So that's not what we want. The reason why this happens is because we chose a molecule that has a very high intrinsic efficiency, or quantum yield. So in the absence of the antenna, its quantum yield is 1. That means once the molecule is excited, for sure, it will emit a photon if it goes down to its ground state again. Okay? That means 100% efficiency. So we cannot increase more than 100%. So the antenna can only make things worse. So you see here that the quantum yield goes down. So this is a bad news for light emitting devices. We can only make things worse. But provided that we have a 100% efficient system to begin with, you don't have to improve a 100% efficient system. If we start, on the other hand, with something that has an efficiency of 10 to the minus 3, and this is like photoluminescence from a carbon nanotube, then as we bring the antenna close, we can increase the quantum efficiency by a factor 10. This is not 100%. There is a pre-factor, OK? But nevertheless, we increase the efficiency by a factor of 10 by just coupling it to a spherical gold particle. And other antenna geometries can have a much stronger effect. So there are opportunities here for light emitting devices. OK, so I, this is more or less getting to the end of my talk. I would like just to point out some very intriguing and also challenging aspects of this optical antenna business. We're probably mostly accustomed from textbooks to this type of antenna, the lambda half antenna. Okay? The length here okay, corresponds to half of the wavelengths of the radiation that the antenna is interacting with. And this is the external incident radiation. Now, if we look here at an ideally conducting metal bar at <laughs> optical frequencies, and we try to locate where is the resonance. This has 220 nanometers length. okay. And now we tune the wavelengths, and we look at where do we have the resonance for this structure. It's a little bit shifted, OK, because of the finite thickness. But you know, antenna engineers know how to take care of this, OK, the, the, the finite thick, uh, thickness and the shift. But this is you know, our lambda half resonance. Okay. Now the problem is there are no ideal conductors at optical frequencies. So metals at optical frequencies more, more behave like uh, strongly coupled plasmas. That means light gets into the material. Okay? And the cooperative effect of all the electrons okay, is what finally decides what the resonance is. We refer to this as a surface plasmon resonance. Okay? So the electron does not respond to the external field, but to a scaled internal field. Okay? 
So if we take the same geometry, but we now replace it with one of the best metals we have at hand at optical frequencies, our resonance shifts to lambda of 5.6. We'd say it is no longer lambda health. It is lambda health. But it's no longer the lambda of the external radiation. Because if you look at the charge distribution here, it's exactly the same as here. So it's a different wavelength. OK, and we set out of investigating how do we scale the external wavelengths to the true wavelengths that defines the antenna properties. And here you see an example for gold. These are wires of different uh, diameters, OK, in nanometers. So if we have incident radiation of 800 nanometers, and we would like to build an antenna that is 5 nanometers in diameter, OK, no, 10 in this example. Then basically we find an effective wavelength of 220 nanometers, which means the antenna length has to be 110 nanometers. And that brings me back to the initial slide where I said these little gold nanorods are our lambda health antennas. They are, OK? This corresponds exactly to this length. Now, this scaling can be also used then to make more fancy antenna designs. And this is an example from a Spanish group. This was published last year, where they use basically you know, these, these little segments to build an optical Yagi Uda antenna. And they place here single molecules, and they observe the radiation pattern. Now, this molecule emits one photon at a time, OK? But for each annual photon, OK, basically a coherence is established over the entire antenna structure. And that coherence then decides where the photon is going to. OK, so you can use this, for example, of building directional single photon emitters. Now, interestingly here, you know, this is the orientation of the dipole of the molecule. Without the antenna, OK, this molecule would radiate preferentially perpendicular to, the, you know, to its dipole axis, OK? And the antenna, OK, finally decides, no, this is not the proper way. I want you to emit this way. OK, so you saw this slide already. I, also, I already told you that you know, this is a coupled entity. The antenna influences the molecule and vice versa. Um, I showed you this based on the example of um, you know, uh, modifying the emission rate and uh, you know, the absorption of radiation in the antenna. But there's more to the game. Okay? And uh, so this brings me to the last slide here. The momentum of a photon or of light is usually associated with the wavelengths of light. So for visible radiation, okay, we get here wave vectors measured in inverse centimeters of 10 to the 5. Okay. Now, an electron in a solid state having the same energy has a momentum that is about two orders of magnitude larger, okay, 10 to the 7 inverse centimeters. So when light interacts with materials, we are accustomed of having transitions that are vertical in the band diagram, OK? If you have a conduction band and a valence band, OK, then the optical transitions are vertical. We don't have diagonal transitions, OK? That's because we can neglect the photon momentum. It's so small, OK, that you know, it appears to be vertical. Now, the photon momentum in the near field close to an antenna is no longer given by this number, but it is really given by the confinement. So no longer I have wavelengths here, but I have here an antenna parameter. And that brings my photon momentum up by two orders of magnitude. So now suddenly, I'm in the range of electron momentum which means in a band diagram, I can also have diagonal transitions. Okay. So if I not only have vertical, but also diagonal transitions, I'm basically enhancing the light matter interaction. Okay. I just have more possibilities of interacting. 
The other thing that we are accustomed of doing is when light interacts with matter, okay, here I have the orbital, say, of a molecule, initial state, final state, and here we have the interaction, this is the electron momentum, here we have uh, the field. We usually say, well, the field doesn't vary over our quantum orbitals. That's why we're pulling this vector potential out, and what we're ending up with are the dipole selection rules. Okay. But again, if you look at these spatial variations, that the, the determines the spatial dependence of the vector potential. And if we're interacting, say, with, with a quantum dot of similar size, we can no longer pull this out. So the light-matter interaction gets enhanced even further. We have selection rules that we traditionally do not encounter by standard um, uh, radiation that we focus on a target. OK, so these are two aspects that I find very intriguing and I believe will have, um, uh, can have potential impact for optical sensors and detectors. OK, so that brings me to the end, uh, to my conclusions. I generally talked about the antenna-coupled light-matter interactions. I showed some examples where we can achieve spatial resolutions in spectroscopy of about 10 nanometers. I believe there are opportunities for light-emitting devices and photovoltaics. I didn't talk about this, but just let me tell you, metals are highly nonlinear materials. Okay? So you can use these antenna structures to do localized frequency conversion. And to give you an idea of how efficient these nonlinearities are, the nonlinearity in gold is two to three orders of magnitude higher than, say, in lithium niobate, a nonlinear crystal that you use to generate, like, the green light in laser pointers. Okay. So um, again, there's a lot of opportunity to do on-chip frequency conversion using uh, uh, optical antenna structures. And I would like to thank a couple of collaborators that I didn't introduce by picture in here. And thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Uh, we have time for several questions. So please raise your hand, and Mikhail and I will bring the mic to you. Uh, hello. Is this on? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jordan Katine from Hitachi Global Storage Technologies. First of all, thank you for an excellent talk. I'm sure you're probably aware that the magnetic recording industry is using or planning on using such antennas for uh, thermally assisted recording. I was wondering if you knew of any other uh, applications coming up for these uh, antenna technologies. Um. I'm aware of the heat-assisted recording, and uh, I would say there's an entire community that uses, you know, near-field heat and studies near-field heat transfer. Okay, um, I didn't talk about this. I don't entertain any research program in my group in this direction. But uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm knowledgeable that this this is gaining a lot of momentum. Thank you. I have a question here. Hi. Um, so, are all these things that you showed um, are they imaged at the room temperature, or is there, or, or are you able to use these antenna at different temperatures? And what effect would that have? It depends on the application. Everything I, I, I showed is at room temperature, okay? And, and the work on the uh, red cell uh, is, is even in, in, in liquids. Okay. Um, we do some low temperature work, but this is not because of. Right, it still works. It's actually, you know, you even reduce the losses in metal, so the antennas become even a little bit more effective at low temperatures. Yeah. Hi, uh, you were saying that um, in the near field, the uh, photon has an, a momentum roughly equivalent to that of an electron. So does that mean that you can get efficient uh, emission of light from an indirect band gap? Yeah, so I don't know of any experimental studies that it would have proven that. But there are different uh, theoretical studies that have proposed that, especially for silicon uh, photovoltaics. Um, but I haven't seen any experimental results. Uh, 
I have a question. Uh, would you please go into the slide with the Yagi antenna? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this one. Yes. Um, did the one that you're showing here basically is the antenna pattern, right? That's the radiation pattern, right? Yeah, but by definition, the antenna pattern, radiation pattern, typically means uh, the pattern can be drawn based on assumption. The, the, the point where you, you observe the strength has to be in the far field relative to the uh, antenna. This is the so, far field pattern. This is the far field this pattern. This is the far field pattern. But my question is, will this apply for your general application you discussed? Yes, yes. You will? So this, okay. this I, I was here very brief, I, I apologize. But you know, this is your antenna structure, right. and I'm taking here an individual molecule that I place, you know, at different points near my feed element. Right. Okay? Right. And I'm able then to, you know, generate this radiation pattern based on single photon emission. Okay. But I'm just saying, I because I make because I'm not uh, sure I understand completely, but I. I, I got an impression maybe it's for s s at some point you were getting the uh, molecule really close to your uh, particle, which is the antenna. When you're getting really close, you essentially become near field, right? Then this plot will not stand in that case. Well, the configuration here is fixed. Okay? Yeah, configuration so, so, is fixed. So, yes. so this group, of course, shows a favorable situation. If I bring the molecule too close to the surface, okay? Then it's gone. Okay? Right. The efficiency right. goes completely down. Exactly. Yeah. So there is a point. The assumption will be true only up to a certain point. That's that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So there is a lot of you know computation and engineering that goes into this. Okay. So the second question I have is, typically antenna field people in addition talk about radiation pattern, right? They also talk about the efficiency itself. Is there any you know analogy in this case you can talk about efficiency as well? Yeah, I, I have to refer you to an article. I, I showed the reference at the beginning. I can give it to you. But um, a lot of antenna terminology, right. gain, directivity, and so on, impedance, okay, can be nicely translated into this scenario. It does. In fact, okay. you know, um, what, what, what is very nice is that here, you know, we have somehow a, a boundary between two disciplines that, that were thought to be completely distinct, okay? Antenna theory and quantum optics. For example, you know, we can talk about in, impedance here. Right. If, if we see the whole thing from an antenna perspective, if we see it from a quantum optics perspective, we would call, uh, talk about the density of states. Right. The two things are exactly the same thing, formally exactly the same thing. Right. So there's one publication that tried to establish, okay, the terminology uh, from an antenna perspective. I see. So the last, sorry, last question. So uh, will, this may be a stupid question, will this one be applicable in an area where you have a transmitter receiver, let's say they're 10 meter away, just doing wireless optics, this can apply, this technology in general? 10 meters. Uh, I'm just taking an example. How about two? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, currently, this goes over micron length scales. No? Um, but uh, several groups are working on it, okay, of having a receiving and a transmitting antenna, and, this, and, and two basically like single molecules that, that uh, serve as receiver and transmitters. The distances in between are still micron scales, so not 10 meters, but I'm not sure whether we ever get to this scale. Okay. Hi, uh, Helen Liu, Columbia University. Uh, really, really enjoyed your talk. It was beautiful. Uh, well, just a quick question regarding the sort of additional possibility of using this technique. You coupled your system with Raman spectroscopy or Raman imaging. Is it possible to get a compositional map at that scale? Yeah, so, so, so it's a good point. We, of course, what we measure is, is some optical fingerprint an optical signature. And we have to somehow make some assumptions, of course, how this relates to material properties. In Raman scattering, uh, we basically imaging the vibrational modes, the phonon modes. No? And uh, of course, they're related to density and, 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 and other factors. So in, in terms of Raman scattering, I would say yes. In terms of fluorescence, this is probably too limited to really be able to identify the composition of a material.
Yeah, uh, one, one last question, I guess. Uh, yeah, Eve Bynes from Bell Labs. Um, what is the, do you also have, like, in a regular antenna, talk about a bandwidth? Like, in a regular antenna, you would have the RF bandwidth, or so would you have an, an optical bandwidth, and how wide would that be? Yes, so... Um, and how well can you predict it? The antennas that we use here, they're very resonant. Yes. Okay, yeah. so, so have a very um, narrow bandwidth. Okay. But other antenna designs... Uh, I mean, this Yagi would groups, probably be very wide, but no? If you would make this Yagi... Right. Um, other people are using the, um, the two cones. What are they called? Bow ties. Bow tie antennas. Okay. No, they, they have yeah, a larger sure. bandwidth. Uh, so this is pursued in other groups. Uh, here, we would like to be able to have a mobile antenna. So to position it close to a target that is of interest to us. Okay. So that restricts, of course, the set of antenna designs that we can use. So it's very similar to microwave engineering, in fact. I, mean, I, I, yeah, I agree, yes. Yeah. Okay. Javier Sanchez from Inaue. One question. You mentioned a single photon, and I would like to know why. How do you know it's a single photon, and why? That, that's a very tricky question. I have to revise my statements. I would say... Um, our detectors go click. Whether this is a signature for a single photon, some people might disagree. Um, but if we have, you know, we use single photon detectors. Okay, so, so we, we get these discrete readings, and each reading is associated with a photon. To really prove it's a single photon, I think one would need to do more sophisticated experiments. What would you say? I, I would like to know your opinion. <laughs> okay, uh, let's thanks Lucas for the excellent talk and the question and answer.